faithful and just to do that. But before we do open the Word, let's begin with committing our time to God in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for the privilege of sitting under the sound of Your Word. And we ask our God that this eternal Word, the sword of Your Spirit, would do the work that it can do to cut us to the heart, to challenge, encourage, convict. Lord, if there be one here that knows not the light and the life, the love that's in the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that Your Holy Spirit would convict of sin, of righteousness and of judgment, and that person would be drawn to the One who is able to give life eternal, life abundant. And our God, we just would ask that this morning that You would cause Your message to penetrate speaker and listener alike, that each of us would determine afresh to live to please You, to live to please the Lord Christ till He come again. We pray in His name. Amen. Just uh, a little bit of a note for uh, by way of update. The... Uh, Last week of camp is coming in this morning, the youth camp, and if there's anybody here high school age that would like to come out and uh, partake in a, a week of challenging messages and of a number of other things, there's still lots of room. The camp is not anywhere near full, so any high school age, uh, 16 and up, are welcome to come out. Last week there was one lad that professed the Lord at family camp, and so that's made every single week of the, camp, of the summer there's been at least one person that has professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about, is for people to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and then to be trained in the Word of God, to love Him and to serve Him. And uh, it's not always the easiest thing in the world. A lot of times you open up the book and you share things from the Bible and people get upset. People many times don't like to hear. It says in Second Peter, there are many things in the Word that are difficult and hard to be understood, which the foolish and the unlearned wrestle with to their own destruction. But we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we're to take the things of this book and we're to swallow them down, the things that are smooth and the things that are hard, the things that are pleasant and the things that are difficult. I remember a few years ago teaching a Sunday school class and we were in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where it says, This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. And several of the young people in that class took me to task immediately afterwards and they said, look, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with having a physical relationship with somebody if you love them. You don't have to be married. That piece of paper doesn't mean anything. You can go ahead and, and if, you, if you love somebody, it's okay. And I said, well, you may think it's okay, but the Bible says that this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication, that you hold back. Yes, you're going to have desires. Yes, there's going to be temptations. Yes, you're going to have feelings. God didn't create you with ice running through your veins. But God says that you're to hold back. You're to abstain. You're to be clean. You're to be holy. And they were not pleased. They were not a bit pleased with that message. In fact, they were very upset. And this one girl, she said, Well, I don't like that and I don't care. She says, I think you're old-fashioned and I think this and I think that about you. And I said, Well, my Bible says here, if you despise, you're not despising Tim. Who's Tim anyway? He's nobody. If you're despising, you're not despising man, but you're despising God who also hath given us of His Holy Spirit. He that despises, despises not man, but God. And so it's not my word. It's the word of God. Three years later, after that girl left her home and moved in with a young man and got pregnant and he moved away and then she came back to the Lord and then she went out to Bible school out uh, on the West Coast and she came back she took me aside and through tears she said, I wish I'd have listened to you four years ago. I wish I'd have listened to what God had to say because I realize now that that wasn't you, that was God. And I'm sorry. One child, sorry, too late. A half a dozen or more heartaches, too late. A gallon of tears, too late. She came to realize that what God says in this book is for our benefit. Sometimes it's not hard, easy to swallow and sometimes we don't appreciate it, but it's for our benefit. And so we're to please God. And what I'd like to talk about simply this morning is man-pleasers and God-pleasers. We've got to decide, what are we going to be in this life? Are we going to live to simply please man or are we going to live to please God? And for some of you that preach the Word, you're going to have to decide in your preaching. Are you going to preach to please men or are you going to preach to please God? Wes shared with me a few weeks ago what was the brother's name? 
Lehman Strauss. I've read some of his books, been really challenged and encouraged. But a few years ago, he stood up and publicly declared, I've been guilty of preaching to please men. Now, all the men that he was preaching to appreciated because he preached the Word and he preached Christ. But there were probably some things that he didn't preach that he should have preached. And probably other things that he preached that he could have left unpre unpreached. And so we're not living and we're not preaching to please men. We're not preaching to tickle the ears. A fella, the story's told of a fella down south that was preaching in a, in a church. And right after the church, he just finished preaching and he felt that everything went okay. And after the church, there was this big guy in a little gray suit come wandering back to the back. He said, that was terrible. He went out the back door. Slipped in the side door and he come out again. He says, that was rotten. You won't be back here. And he went out. Slipped in the side door and got in line and he come through again. And he says, that was boring. Yeah, no, that was really boring. Went out. He came in the side door and he come back through the, by the preacher again. He goes, that was garbage. That really stinks. Went out. Come around the side door. Come in again. He said, you read your notes. Frankly, they weren't worth reading. And he was gone. Well, the fellow was wondering, you know, oh, boy, what did I say? And then he talked to the elders afterwards, and he says, you know, I've enjoyed the fellowship. It's been a wonderful time being with you. He says, I'm only troubled about one thing. He says, the, the little man in the gray suit. Oh, the, the elders said, don't worry about that guy. Don't worry about him. The fellow, you know, he means well, but he's got a mental handicap, and he cannot think for himself. He can only repeat what he hears others say. But you know, that would hurt a lot of preachers. Because we like to please people. I mean, that's natural. Popularity. People want to be popular. People want to be well-received. People want to be well-respected. That's a normal, natural feeling. But look in the Scriptures at some of the greatest preachers in the Scripture. John the Baptist lost his head. Eleven out of the twelve apostles lost their lives. Mocked, beaten, ridiculed, pulled to pieces, burned alive, fed to the lions, lighting the Colosseum. It's not a popular message when you preach. Christ crucified, risen and coming again. It's not a popular message. But you see, we've got to decide, are we going to be man-pleasers? Are we going to be God-pleasers? And if we seek to preach the whole counsel of the Word of God without compromise in these last days, we're not going to be very popular. Guaranteed we're not going to be very popular. Just like to take and look at a few man pleasers in the Bible, and then take a look at a few God pleasers. First of all, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, we've got a classic example of a man pleaser. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul started out real good. He was little in his own eyes. Even though physically he was head and shoulders above all of the people around him, he was a humble man. And he was an obedient man. He went to, you know, at the bidding of his father to do his father's will. And he was a meek man, a mild man. But later on, you see that he turned. He started out, I believe, as a God-pleaser. And whether the people liked it or not, he was anointed to be the king over Israel. He was God's anointed. He was God's chosen instrument. He was God's chosen vessel to be king. God had anointed him to be king. Through Samuel the prophet. In 1 Samuel 15, he says, Samuel says to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. The words of the Lord. And you're going to notice something, I hope, this morning, that a man pleaser, a man pleaser will not hearken a hundred percent to the words of the Lord won't do it. A man pleaser will not. For the God pleaser, the Word of God is the absolute final authority for faith and practice. Not just lip service, not just I, I, I believe it, and not just stand up and say, I believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of the original autographs and on and on and on and on and on. But let's get down to shoe leather. If we really, really believe the Word of God, then we'll obey it. We'll do it. We'll put it into practice. We'll listen and we'll obey. And we sang the song this morning, Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trusting and obeying the words. Not just believing them and not just knowing them, but doing them. Putting them into practice. And then the Lord gives some very specific instructions. He says, I remember what Amalek did to Israel. And in verse 3, he says, Now go and smite. Utterly destroy 
All that they have, spare them not, slay man, woman, infant, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and ass. That's not a pleasant message to get, a message of judgment. And we're living in a generation where people don't like to hear negative messages. People do not want to hear hard sayings. They're like the, the, the guys, I think it was in the book of Isaiah, where they said, Speak unto us pleasant words. Speak unto us smooth words. We don't want to hear anything hard. We don't want to hear anything difficult. We don't want to hear anything that goes against our grain, that ruffles our feathers, that makes our pew a little bit uncomfortable. We don't want anything like that. We want to have our ears tickled. We want to hear what we want to hear. Now, this is not a pleasant message. I thank God that I've never, ever received a message like this where I had to go and utterly destroy men and women and infants, little suckling children. But I'll tell you what, if God gives the message, then that's His Word. And we ought to obey it. We ought to obey God's Word. And instead of watering down the message like we have, you know, it just it bothers me that sin is no longer sin anymore. Sin is no longer sin. I mean, uh, the sin of drunkenness is alcoholism. The sin of adultery, well, they're having an affair. The abomination of sodomy is an alternate lifestyle. It's okay. And on and on and on the list goes. And yet God says sin is sin and sin has to be dealt with. And if sin's not dealt with, it's going to come back to haunt you. It's going to be a thorn in your side. It's going to be a prick in your eye. And I know what that's all about because I come off the mountain the other night and got a stick right in, right in my eye. And I'll tell you, it doesn't feel good. But you see, if we don't deal with sin, it's going to come back to haunt us. And Saul didn't deal with sin. He didn't do what God told him to do. The Lord gave him a very simple message, gave him very simple directions, but he was disobedient. He didn't obey the word of the Lord. You come down through here and you notice in verse 8, he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. He utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen, the fatlings and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. You see, God had spoken, and that should have been good enough. God had given His Word on it. But you see, we don't many times appreciate God's Word. We are, you know, we're smarter than God, and we know better than He does. As a few years ago, in Sault Ste. Marie, a woman uh, came up to me, and she happened to be, just a little background, she had been kicked out of the church that she was in, so she started up a church of her own, and I happened to be teaching Bible in the public school, where she was also a teacher, and uh, she asked me specifically, she said, what do you think about women preachers? Now, that's a can of worms if you want to open one, isn't it? Isn't that a good can of worms to open up and start talking about? Well, she asked me, and so I told her. I said, Sister, I said, frankly, what I think doesn't amount to a hill of beans. And excuse me, I'm not being disrespectful, but, but what you think doesn't matter either. It really doesn't. What you or I think is not worth the powder that it would take to blow it to hell if it doesn't line up with what God says. What you think, what I think, what Joe Blow thinks, what all the scholars on both sides of the issue think doesn't really matter. What matters is what God thinks, what God says. So I opened up some of the scriptures and I said, whatever you think and whatever I think, here's what God says. Here's what God says right here. Here's what God says right here. Here's what God says right here. And she said, well, I don't like that. And I said, well, I'm sorry if you don't like it, but that's what God says. And we read a little bit further and it says, if anyone think himself to be spiritual thinks himself to be something, let him acknowledge that the things that are written here are the commandments of the Lord. And if any man be ignorant, what's it say? Let him be. If, if, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. There will be people always, there always has been and there always will be people that will not hearken unto thus saith the Lord. Will not hearken unto what God says. Saul was one of them. He started out real good, but he turned into a man pleaser. He turned to a person that began listening to what men say, what men say, what men say, instead of what God says. The old saying, God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. In my revised versions, any of you remember, I've said it often enough. How's it go? Nope. God said it. That settles it. Whether I believe it, whether you believe it, whether Joe Blow or, 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 or John Doe or anybody else believes it, that doesn't really matter. If God said it, that settles it because His Word is the final authority on the matter. And one day we're going to stand before Him. 
and we're going to give an account, not for having done what somebody says here or somebody says there or what somebody else thinks or because we think we've got a better idea than what God had. We're going to stand and give an account of what we've done with His Word. And man-pleasers have a low view of the Word of God. They have a low view of the Lordship of Christ. God-pleasers have the highest regard for the Word of God. The highest regard. God says it. And that settles it. And what Saul did was simple disobedience. He rejected the Word of God. And see, incomplete obedience is disobedience. And if we neglect or reject the Word of God, then we're walking in disobedience to God. And God cannot and will not bless disobedience to His Word. If we lightly esteem His Word, then we're taking away from His person, we're taking away from His character, we're robbing His Son of His glory, and He's not happy about that. I don't think that there's a, a person in here that would be happy to have their dearest, most precious person on the earth slandered and abused and, and uh, ridiculed and mocked. But you see, if we do that to the Word of God, then we are taking away from the incarnate Word, we're taking away from the written Word, we're, we're attacking the very God that we claim to be loving and serving. And you see what it says here in verse 11? The Lord speaks, He says, It repenteth me that I've set up Saul to be king. He has turned back from following me. Now, he was following the Lord. He started out following the Lord. And I don't know how many years exactly he followed the Lord, but he followed the Lord for a good while. But he says, He's turned back from following me, and he hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. It ought to grieve us when we see God's people turning away from God's Word. It ought to make us sad. There should be, never, ever be any rejoicing. There should never, ever be any delight when we see God's people falling. When I heard people uh, mocking and ridiculing and, and making jokes about Jim Swaker and Jimmy Baker and Jimmy Swaggart, it hurt. But for the grace of God, I'd be right there. And but for the grace of God, you would be too. But for the grace of God, we should never rejoice. God doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. How much less pleasure does He take in to see the, the downfall of His saints, to see His children turning back from following Him? No pleasure there. He's not happy. And we shouldn't be happy either. We should be sad. We should weep gallons of tears. And we should pray for the restoration and work for the restoration and go and lovingly confront and deal with sin and make things right and go on ahead for the Lord. But he comes to Saul and he says, He repenteth me. He's turned back from following me. He hath not performed my commandments. And then you get down here and he cried to the Lord all night and then he comes and Samuel says to Saul, he says, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And that's our fickle heart. We're a lot like old Saul. We'll disobey the Word of God and disobey the Word of God and disobey the Word of God and then we'll turn around and we'll say, I have performed the commandment of the Lord and we'll give ourselves a little pat on the back and we'll think that we're doing really wonderful. And we're not. Incomplete obedience is disobedience. And if we're rebuked about something that is contrary to the Word of God, then we do well to fall on our face before the Lord, to repent as it were in sackcloth and ashes and to seek out the, the face of the Lord so that we can be right, so that we can be clean, so that we can be holy. He said, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And then Samuel says, What meaneth this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears? He said, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And then meanwhile, you've got a thousand sheep that are saying, Baloney, you haven't either. You didn't. What do you read up here? It says, Go and destroy man, woman, infant, suckling, ox, sheep. Didn't it say that? Destroy all the sheep? But see, Saul had a better idea. He said, well, you know, I kept the best of the sheep to sacrifice to the Lord. You know, I did, I did good. I did well. And I spared the king. And he says, surely the bitterness of death is past. And you know what Samuel did? Samuel hacked him to pieces before the Lord. Not a pleasant task. Not a pleasant sight. But the word of God was fulfilled. And the word of God will be fulfilled. The word of God will stand true long after you and I have perished. Long, and out, long after the worms are crawling in and out our eyeballs, the Word of God will stand true. The Word of God will be right on forever and ever and ever and ever, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, whether anybody else likes it or believes it or not. The Word of God is true. He says, I perform the commandment of the Lord. And the sheep say, baloney. And the cows say, move on. The oxen are saying, that's not right. And King Agag is right there saying, well, you know, the bitterness of death is past. No, it's not. 
Saul said they brought from the Amalekites, the people. You see down here, Saul and the people. In verse 15, the people. Saul gathered the people. He was to be the king over his people. But you see, the Lord comes first, not the people. The Lord comes first. Husbands, the Lord comes first before your wife. The Lord comes first before your children. The Lord comes first before your job. The Lord and His Word are number one. And if the Lord and His Word are not number one, then there's something wrong, something out of whack, then you need to get it right back on track. The commandment of the Lord was neglected. The commandment of the Lord was rejected. And God was sad. And God's people, it was a sad day for the people of God. The people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord. And he said, I will tell you what the Lord said to me. In verse 17, When thou wast little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee to be king over Israel. And he says, a simple message. Go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalekite and fight against them till they'll be consumed. He says, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. He still couldn't get it through his thick head. And this is the another another first thing of a man pleaser is they've got a higher regard for the word of man than they do for the word of God. They have a higher regard for the fear of man than the fear of God. And you see here, they will not receive a rebuke from a man of God. Samuel came and Samuel was the man of God and Samuel came and he told him, he says, you've sinned. You have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. And he turns and I said, I have obeyed. Well, what about the sheep? What about the oxen? What about the king? The evidence was right before his eyes that he had disobeyed the Lord. But he couldn't see it. He would not receive the word of God from the mouth of God. He wouldn't receive the word of God from the mouth of the servant of God. He would not receive the word of God. The word of man, yes, but not the word of God. He says, but the people. Boy, doesn't that come up a lot? But the people took the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the sheep things that should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord. They did it for a good cause. The people, the people. But you see, we shouldn't be so interested in the people as we should be in the Lord. I've got in my library books. And I like books. But there's a danger if we let those books become the authority over what God says. You see, this is the Word of God. And there's, there's a lot of people, I hear them arguing, I hear them at the camp arguing over some of the issues. We mentioned one this morning, the, the woman's role. Okay, and we could argue until the cows come in about that. And we could argue about divorce. And we could argue about abortion. We could argue about homosexuality. And all of these issues that, that, that people are arguing about. And, you know, I could go into my library and I could bring out books and I could stack the ones on the one side and the ones on the other. And for those of you who wanted, you could go and you could line up scholars from here to kingdom come that believe one or the other things. But it makes me sick when I see the people of God that can quote scholar after scholar after scholar after scholar, but they can't quote, thus saith the Lord. What does God say? You see, what all the people think doesn't really matter if it's not lining up with what God says. The people, the people, the people, the people, they did this, and he hearkened unto the voice of the people, but he didn't hearken unto the voice of the Lord. He was a man pleaser. He was living to please men. He wasn't living to please God. Now, the Lord says it's better to obey than to sacrifice. Does the Lord have as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He says, Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Disobedience is rebellion. Rebellion, the Lord says in verse 23, is as the sin of witchcraft, witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord hath rejected thee from being king. And then Saul says, I've sinned. I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. Now pardon my sin and turn and worship with me. Now that sounds like a good confession, doesn't it? Sounds like a good confession. He says, I have sinned. And there was remorse. And I've seen that many, many times where somebody will be rebuked and they will say, I've sinned and there's remorse. You see, Judah said, I've sinned and there was remorse. I betrayed innocent blood and there was remorse. But was there repentance? Was there repentance? Repentance means that there's a complete turnaround. There's a change of mind. 
There's a change of heart. There's a change of direction. But we know that there wasn't repentance here. We know there wasn't because the blessing of the Lord comes upon the repentant heart. Remember when David repented? The Lord, David, said, David had the thing, right? Saul thought that the Lord was all impressed with a whole bunch of religious show. He thought the Lord was all impressed with playing church. That's what he thought. He thought, well, you know, I've got, I've got all these sacrifices and I'm worshiping the Lord and I'm doing, you know, what the Lord says. I'm doing what God says the way I want to do it. But God wasn't pleased and God didn't bless. And God says, you've been rejected because you've rejected my words. You're trying to do my work your way, not my work my way, and it'll never be blessed. And Samuel says, you I will not return with you because you've rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And you can see again that, that he didn't really repent. You can see that there was no true repentance because down in verse 30 he says, I have sinned, yet honor me now before people. He was interested right to the bitter end with the people, the people, the people, the people. He was a people pleaser. He was a man pleaser. But he was not a God pleaser. He says, I have sinned, yet honor me before the elders of my people, before the elders of Israel, and turn with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. It's a sad day when we fear men more than we fear God. He was rejected from being king. Over in verse, six, uh, verse 7 of chapter 16, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. David was a God pleaser. He sinned. I mean, we look at the sins of David compared to the sins of Saul. The fact that Saul did not utterly destroy all the sheep, didn't kill the king, that seems like a small sin compared to killing a righteous man and committing adultery with another man's wife and the cover-up and the plot and everything else. But you see, David was forgiven. David was restored because he had a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. And it says, he is the one that gave us those wonderful words from the Spirit of God in Psalm 51. The Lord doesn't have a greater delight in sacrifices and offerings as in a broken and contrite heart. And if we break ourselves before the Lord, He'll restore us. We, we all sin, every one of us, every day of the week. But we can be restored if we truly repent. But if we fear man and we fear the Word of man more than we fear God, then we're going to just sign our death sentence as far as any fruitfulness and faithfulness to the Lord is concerned. Saul was a man-pleaser. A man-pleaser seeks the praise of men, not of God. A man-pleaser fears men, doesn't fear God. A man-pleaser has a low view of God's Word. And a man-pleaser operates on the level of the soul and the flesh, doesn't operate in the realm of the Spirit. And this was, this was characteristic of Saul. He wasn't operating on the highest level. Spirituality, in tune with the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And his downfall... You see it. Man, I'll tell you what. You mess with the Word of God, the Lord will mess with your brain. If you mess with God's Word, He'll mess with your head. You can't mess with God's Word. Or you're, gonna, you're headed for disaster. When Nebuchadnezzar messed with the Word of God, he was a madman. He went on his hands and knees for seven years. When Saul messed with the Word of God, he went out of his mind. An evil spirit tormented him. He had to have David come in and minister to him. He did some crazy things. He took a javelin and threw it at his own son. Tried how many times to kill the Lord's anointed. He ended up going to the witch of Endor for counsel to call up Samuel from the dead. He ended up committing suicide. You mess with the Word of God, God's going to mess with your head. You don't dare mess with the Word of God. We need to fear God. We need to fear His Word. We're living in a, re in a generation where the fear of God is gone. There's no fear of God before their eyes. We need to reverence God. We need to tremble at His Word. When's the last time you read something from this book and trembled? Tell you what, if it's been very long, I encourage you, get on your knees with your Bible open and read it. There's plenty in there worth trembling about. There's plenty in there. For us as God's people, never mind the unsaved, there's plenty in here. We should have the fear of God. We should tremble at His Word. But you see, David, David was a God-pleaser. And he has a testimony to this day. And he will sit on the throne in the millennium, according to my Bible. And he has the blessing of God, but not Saul. He pleased the people at the time, didn't please the Lord. Who are you living to please? Who am I living to please? Let's look at a, a couple more just very quickly. The time's running out. 
In fact, I'm not even going to turn there. If you're a Berean, you look it up yourself. But in John chapter 12, among the chief rulers, there were many who believed, but they wouldn't confess him because they were afraid that they would be put out of the synagogue. The fear of man, the fear of man. It says they love the praise of men more than they love the praise of God. If you want to have men pat you on the back, fine, you'll have your reward, but you will not have the, the blessed thou be thou of the Lord. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You won't have that if you're living to please men if you're living to make people happy, if you love the praise of men and you're afraid you might be put out of your little clique. Saul wanted to have the power, wanted to have the position, wanted to have the title, wanted to have the prestige, but he ended up with nothing. You can read it if you're Bereans again. Read it in Matthew chapter 23. The scribes, the Pharisees, they like the chief seats, the highest places. They like the titles. They like to be called master and like to be called rabbi and like to be called father. They like all the titles, like all the positions. But the Lord says, you're a bunch of blind guides. You're a bunch of hypocrites. Play your games if you want to. But I won't bless them. I won't honor them. I won't respect them. Ananias and Sapphira, they played the game. They played the game to please people. They saw, man, these guys, they gave their all to the Lord. And look at, man, the, I'm sure that when Barnabas and these other people gave 100% to the Lord and they saw that the people, how the people responded, because it's exciting to see people step out for the Lord. There's a young man sitting right here that's going to go into the lake today to obey the Lord in baptism at 1.30. If you're not doing anything, come out. And I'm sure that God's heart is delighted when His children obey. God's heart is thrilled when His children obey His words. When we neglect them or reject them, He's not happy. And you see here, again, Ananias and Sapphira wanted to please the people. But the spiritual heart saw right through it. Peter saw. He says, You're, you've conspired to lie to God, to lie to the Holy Ghost. And they went out peace first. You see it later with Peter and Barnabas. Sad to say, even Peter and Barnabas at one point fell prey. There's no, there's no guarantee for any one of us, no matter how long we've walked with the Lord, there's no guarantee. Except we keep our eyes on the Lord and on His Word, there's no guarantee that we'll keep on being a God-pleaser. Remember when Peter and Barnabas in Galatians chapter 2? Remember? It says that they saw, heard about these people coming from Jerusalem and they separated themselves. They dissimulated. And it says even Barnabas was carried away. And Paul says, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. If there's a man pleaser, they need to be confronted. They need to be confronted with the Word of God. And Peter evidently received this rebuke because later we hear him saying in Second Peter, our beloved brother Paul has written. Must not have been any long-lasting bitterness or animosity there, even though he had been publicly and soundly rebuked by the Apostle Paul at Galatia. Must have been fellowship restored because years later he says, our beloved brother Paul has written in the Scriptures. So there's no, there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee for any of us. You may have walked with the Lord we see in the Scripture, Asa walked with the Lord for 36 years. Had a heart that was right and perfect and good. For 36 years. But then he turned away from the Lord. And he was diseased in his feet. And then the prophet of God came and he oppressed the man of God that brought him the rebuke. And then it says he oppressed many of the people at that time. And he was wroth with the man of God that brought him the word. He got mad. And that's a good test. It's a good test for a man pleaser. You come up to somebody and give them a good, healthy rebuke, and if they get mad, they're probably not walking in the Holy Spirit of God, probably operating in the realm of the flesh. Because a truly spiritual person will receive a rebuke. A truly spiritual person will receive a rebuke and will be yet wiser. But the Bible says the fool will rage, get mad. He'll get in a rage like Nebuchadnezzar did, like Saul did, like Asa did. You see, if we're not walking in the Spirit, we can't receive a rebuke. But if we are walking in the Spirit, we can. Did Jesus get all bent out of shape every time that they accused Him? Every time they blasted Him? Every time they blamed Him? No. No, He didn't. He didn't because He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was walking in the Spirit. Now, our time is gone. But if you want to be a God-pleaser, if you want to be a God-pleaser, you follow the book. It's just that simple. You do what God says. If you want to please God, you do what He says. 
You can read it yourself in Ephesians, the true servants. Not with eye service as men pleasers. You can read it in Colossians. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but doing the will of God from the heart. Doing the word of God, the will of God from the heart. Not to please men. You can read it in 2 Timothy, the soldier. To please him who hath called him to be a soldier. You can read it in Hebrews. That which is well pleasing in thy sight. You can read it in the Psalms. It says, I will praise the name of God with song and magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord more than ox and bullock. To obey is better than sacrifice. You can read it in Psalm 51. The broken spirit, the broken and contrite heart. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices. You want to please God? Put his word first. Put his son first. Live for the Lord Jesus. You can't please people anyway. You might as well get it through your head now. You'll never please everybody anyway, even if you try. Some people will never be pleased. Kenny and I were talking a couple of weeks ago. The scripture says, As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. It's not always possible. You can't please everybody. But how much should we delight ourselves to please the Lord, to please Him, to serve Him with all of our heart? David was a God-pleaser. True servants of God are God-pleasers. Enoch was a God-pleaser. Paul was a God-pleaser. He says in Galatians chapter 1, If an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel than that which we preach, let him be accursed. He said, Even if I come back and preach another gospel than the pure gospel of the grace of God, that Jesus washed us from our sins with His precious blood and it's by grace alone. Even if I come back and preach you any other thing, let me be accursed. He said, Now you judge. Am I seeking to please men? He said, If I seek to please men, I shall not be the servant of Christ. And, and fellas and girls, if you're a man pleaser, you're not the servant of Christ. You're a servant of the people. You're a servant of yourself. But you're not the servant of Christ. A few years ago, I was preaching in a church and I had been warned ahead of time to be careful said, look out, because there's a certain fella that he often will go up and make a beeline right to the pulpit afterwards and give you a blast. And I just prayed before the message, and I said, God, I don't want to be afraid of what some man's going to say. Just let me share your word. Let me preach what you want me to preach, and let the chips fall where they may. And so I preached what I had on my heart to preach, and immediately afterwards, this old fella came and made a beeline right to the pulpit. He said, who are you? And I told him, where are you from? And I told him. He said, I didn't like that one bit. But that's just what I needed. Keep it up. And then he took off. Whew, I felt good about that. <laughs> month or two later, I was up preaching in the same church. And I preached what was on my heart to preach. In fact, it was from Matthew chapter 23. About people pleasers. And about titles and power and position and prestige and how much more we need to set our heart and our mind on the Lord Christ and seek to please Him and to serve Him. And this guy came like a shot, shing, right to the, right to the front again. He said, there's a lot of people here that don't like that kind of preaching. A lot of people don't like that kind of preaching. But he said, I'm not a lot of people. He said, it was nice having you here, but you won't be back. See you later. He was gone. And he was right. He was right. I'll probably never be back. And it, and it could be the same thing here. But you see, the, the sword of the Spirit was intended to prick our hearts. The sword of God's Word, the Word of God, is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And if this Word of God does not prick our hearts, then there's something wrong either with our hearts or with the vessel that's holding the sword. Because that's what it's supposed to do. It was never intended to tickle the ears. Remember what happened when Peter was in the garden and he went to tickle that guy's ear with the sword? Ping, it fell off. Jesus had to put it back on. This, you can't tickle people's ears with the sword. If you want to tickle people's ears, you're going to have to use philosophy or psychology or you're going to have to use something else other than the sword of the Spirit. This Word of God was never intended to tickle people's ears. It was intended to pierce their hearts. And I just encourage, please consider... Are you going to spend the few moments that we have left before Christ comes? Are we going to be man-pleasers or God-pleasers? Let us hold forth the word of life and proclaim the Son of God in spirit and in truth, whether it pleases people or not. We know that we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks its foolishness, but Christ is the message. We preach not ourselves. We preach the Son of God and the word of God if we want to please God. Let's pray. Our God, we just know that you were... We're delighted with your son. You said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
And Father, we know that we are we're mean vessels. Our God, we stumble and fall and we foul up and our tongues don't work right and our hearts get dirty and our feet get dirty. But our God, we just pray that you would wash us in that precious fountain, wash us in the precious blood of your Son. Set your Holy Spirit upon us and our God.